Welcome to Boswell. It is day 5,438 of us being in business. And we are very thrilled to welcome back in person for the second time, I believe, um, Margo Livesey for her new book, um, the Road from Bellhaven, this is a, an advanced copy because um, they were very excited about getting booksellers to read it. I love the fact that they're like mirror images. So there's a story behind that, which I can tell you later. I learned when I was gossiping with somebody. Um, she is the author of 10 novels, including uh, The Boy in the Field, The Flight of Gemma Hardy, and Eva Moves the Furniture, which has a little connection to this book, I've heard. Um, we are, um, she has taught many places, but she's currently at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, and we are very honored that for this event, she is in conversation with Liam Callanan of the UWM English Department. Thank you for all your help in making this a wonderful program. Um, and I should note that When in Rome comes out in paperback on March 12th. Woohoo! Um, Chris said to describe the book, please use the following adjectives. Margot's book, right. Um, well, actually every other adjective is for Margot's and then the one in between is for yours. So bewitching, seductive, treasure, magic, piercing, powerful, engaging, excellent, eloquent, incandescent, generous, graceful, keen, rich, lush, riveting, thrilling, Thoughtful, a gem. Everyone is from a real review. So I'm just going to note that. So, with that said, please give them a big hand. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Each one of those adjectives could also be applied to Daniel in this bookstore. So, thank you so much, Boss Old Books, for hosting us. Thank you so much for coming here. We're starting a little bit later tonight because we're going to go until midnight and uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Margo and I did a little pregame session where we talked about the book and we thought you would read maybe the first two or 300 pages just to kind of get people a sense of it. Yes, exactly. Um, we actually did talk about Margo reading a little bit to open up the book and to get the voice of the text in the room, which I'm really in favor of. So she's gonna read for a little bit, introduce us to the text. Then I'm gonna ask a few questions. Then I'm gonna invite you all to ask a few questions. And we're gonna ring out the evening about 7.45 so we can let the booksellers get out of here on time tonight. Um, so, Margo, I will turn it over to you to read a little bit. Okay, it's thrilling to be back at Boswell's. I think last time, oh, it's thrilling to be back at Boswell's. I think last time I was here, we were only in the 12 or 1400 days. Mm -hmm. So, it's great. I mean, I feel terrible I haven't been here for so long, but um, it's it's wonderful we've got to 8,000. Oh, is it 8,000? Oh, 5,000. Anyway. Feels like it. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to read um, the opening pages. And perhaps the only thing that it might be helpful to know is that the novel opens in the 1880s in Scotland. The Road from Belhaven. The summer she was 10, she learned not to speak of it. She told the hens, she told the cows, she told the pond at the bottom of the field and the ducks who swam there and her pet jackdaw, Alice, but she did not tell her grandparents, Rab and Flora, or Hugh, the farm boy, or Nellie, who had helped in the house when she, Lizzie, was learning to walk, and whom they still saw every week at the kirk. The first picture came on a drich November day. Her grandmother was in the dairy skimming milk, her grandfather in the fields digging potatoes. Lizzie was beneath the kitchen table, making scones for her doll. She must have been three or four when the flagstone floor and her bowl and spoon disappeared. Instead, she was watching her grandfather, his shirt sleeves rolled up, scything hay in the meadow by the river. He was working his way along the bank, cutting wide swathes. One moment the hay was upright, the next fallen. At the end of the row, he stopped to sharpen the scythe. Lizzie could see his shirt clinging to his back as he ran the whetstone back and forth. He was starting on the next row when the blade bit his leg. She was still exclaiming no, scrambling from beneath the table when the kitchen door opened 
and her grandfather stepped into the room carrying a basket of potatoes. As he washed them at the sink, Lizzie patted his legs, searching for the cut beneath the rough fabric of his trousers. What is it, Lizzie? he said. Do I have mud on me? She told him what she'd seen. I'd have to be guy clumsy, he said, to cut myself digging tatties. She was still wondering why had she seen a scythe, not a fork, why the sun had been shining though the sky was grey, when her grandmother returned and together they went to feed the hens. By the following July, when Neil, their neighbour, carried her grandfather home in a wheelbarrow, she had forgotten the scene beneath the table. Only as Dr Murray made dark, untidy stitches in Rab's leg, did Lizzie recall her glimpse of the meadow months before. She thought of them as pictures because she could see everything so clearly as if she was standing nearby, although she never saw herself. Sometimes she saw ordinary things, her grandmother choosing which hen to kill, a cow stuck in the mud by the river. She saw a picture of Nellie in a white dress at the front of the church, and three months later Nellie announced she was marrying Angus. You could have knocked me down with a feather, her grandmother said, reporting the news at supper. Lizzie started to say she had known for weeks, but her grandfather was already talking about the sheep shearing. All of this happened at Belhaven Farm, which was in that part of Scotland called the Kingdom of Fife, surrounded on three sides by water, the Firth of Forth to the south, the North Sea to the east, the Tay Estuary to the north. Fife was known for its collieries, its fishing, and its university in St Andrews, but the farm was inland, far from the coal mines. The year of Lizzie's birth, the explorer David Livingstone died in Africa, the RMS Atlantic sank off Nova Scotia, and the Scottish Rugby Union was founded. On the farm, the most notable events besides her arrival were the mild weather and the early harvest. Where were her parents? On the wall of her bedroom. Her mother had made the drawing the day they got married. Helen, wearing a dress, the folds nicely shaded, was sitting in a chair. Teddy, in his Sunday suit, stood behind her, his left hand resting on her shoulder. Lizzie seldom glanced at them, but every morning she looked at the little white house with two red doors, which had belonged to Helen and which stood on her chest of drawers. In fine weather, the woman came out of her door. In bad weather, the man emerged. Sometimes each hovered on the threshold, but they could never come out at the same time. Besides the weather house and the drawing, Lizzie had inherited her mother's border terrier, William, whom they buried in the apple orchard soon after her grandfather cut himself, and a handful of stories. Helen could undo any knot. She could imitate a thrush so that the birds sang back. She had rescued a calf from drowning in the river. She was partial to gooseberry jam. About her father, she knew even less. Teddy had been a fisherman. His boat was named St. Philan, after the saint who had lived in a cave on the Fife coast and wrote by the light of his glowing left arm. But neither God nor St. Philan had saved Teddy's boat when the fog rolled in one October day. Seven months later, Lizzie was born. Twelve months later, Helen died. Not because of you, her grandmother had said. Pneumonia. Your father drowned in one way, your mother in another. Thank you. Thank you. You can see what I meant about getting the voice of the text alive in the room. It's beautiful, beautiful. It's a beautiful book. And uh, I had the pleasure of getting to read an early copy and it was mesmerizing. 
Uh, we were talking earlier tonight, there was a review that was very complimentary talking about, it's a lyric book, but it's also propulsive. And I thought, why, when did those two things become mutually exclusive? I don't think all your books are that way. You can't put them down. And this one, this one really in particular, it's a really, it's a, it's a magical book. Uh, and so again, over the next four hours here tonight, I'm going to try to beat you into submission to getting it. No, what I really like, so this is an extraordinary thing that uh, is mentioned at the beginning of the book, and you have an extraordinary history with that book, uh, with that uh, literary device or concept, which is this notion of second sight. So Lizzie, the protagonist of the book, has this ability to see things before they occur, kind of in the static, almost like a picture. She gets, and then she's not sure what to make of them. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that came into the book and what sort of research went into that. I'd be delighted. Thank you for this incredibly complimentary question. Uh, my mother died when I was two and a half. My mother, Eva. And my father died when I was 22. And at that point, I believed myself to have no living relatives in any meaningful way. I was the only child of two only children. And that belief persisted for over 40 years. And then a former student was doing research into my family on Ancestry.com. And she received a letter asking the following, did Eva McEwen have a living child? She forwarded that letter to me and I wrote back and said, Eva McEwen did have a living child and I am she. And the writer turned out to live in Australia. And she explained to me that I was completely wrong. I had many relatives, more really than I can count. They just all happened to live near Brisbane in Australia. Uh, this was all in 2017. And Gail, who wrote the letter, was a is a forceful and lovely person. And the next thing I knew, I was on a plane to Brisbane and meeting many, many people who claimed to be related to me. And I was completely fascinated by this. I was like, um, I was like a water diviner with my sticks, thinking, do I feel something because we share DNA because you're a third cousin twice removed? Does it make a difference? You're a second, you know, I kept, waiting to feel this mysterious thing called family. I mean, it was so bizarre to me. Um, and I have to confess with most of these people, I they seemed like um, lovely, vigorous, barbecuing Australians, but I did not feel much immediate kinship. But I did feel a, a spark with the two oldest members of the family, Gwen and John, siblings. And they told me the story of Lizzie Craig, my great grandmother, and her second sight and how she could see the future. And I had grown up knowing that my mother, Eva, had a relationship with the supernatural, which I had written about in an earlier novel, Eva Moves the Furniture. And suddenly my mother's relationship with the supernatural seemed very different. I thought, oh, maybe it isn't unique. Maybe it's a hereditary gift, uh, which sometimes skips a generation. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's, I mean, the second sight was a given of the novel for me. It was at the heart of the novel for me. And do you, was it, so Lizzie in the book is very young when she, so we see really the whole of her life uh, or the whole of her young life as it progresses. And were you in any way, so how do you balance like the inspiration, but also the challenge or the constraints of writing from someone that you know that like really existed? Well, I think the wonderful thing about Lizzie from my point of view was that I knew so little about her. I, I had her name, I had a few dates, um, a death certificate and, you know, just a few documents. And I think that was important to me because after I finished writing Eva Moves the Furniture, which I published in, I think, 2000 or 2001, and I showed it to the few people who remembered my mother. They all had the same response. They said, this is a lovely novel, but it isn't your mother. 
and I'd somehow replaced my mother with a simulacrum. I mean, I created my mother, but I'd also obliterated her in some way. And so I found it very liberating that I knew so little about Lizzie Craig, that I, that really everything in the book except the second sight and a few other details, the farm, could be invented. And yet there's so much the research that went into this book. There's a one of this is one of those acknowledgement sections that you can't miss because there's all sorts of gems in there. And one of the things, I mean, I learned a lot reading this book. And I learned a lot about how a farm runs and the grandparent Lizzie lives with her grandparents, grows up on this beautiful farm. And I learned about milking and eggs and like what happens when the horse goes still in the pasture. How did you pull together that research? What was your process? Well, some of it was not research, it was memory. I lived for four years in a village in the borders of Scotland, and on the outskirts of the village was a farm owned by a brother and sister, uh, Selby and Chrissy, who had stepped straight out of a William Trevor novel. Um, even as a child, I recognized that everything was quite decrepit. They had a Land Rover and they had a you know, some machinery, but almost everything was as their parents had had the farm. Um, and I spent four years going there, taking care of the hens and the ducks and the cows. And, um, but I didn't feel that was quite enough. So I also read some uh, farming diaries of the 1880s and 1890s. And if any of you have trouble with insomnia, let me recommend a farming diary. It's, uh, you know, it's um, planted the turnips, um, mended the wall, it rained, planted more turnips, it didn't rain, you know, it's just, but they, they're wonderfully tedious and informative, and I'm so grateful to the people who kept those diaries. Well, it's all the more a testament to your magic that they're not tedious on the page. Like I was, I was particularly fascinated and alarmed by it when uh, Lizzie would discover a shellless egg yeah. under the hen. I was very, very alarmed very, by that. Yeah, it's was disturbing. Very yeah. disturbing. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one more piece of research? So, and I don't think I'm spoiling too much. So Lizzie goes to the big city uh, yes. to live for a while. She gets the most fascinating job. Uh, if there's like a fictional job award each year and there should be. So yeah. we're gonna declare it tonight. There's the best fictional job of the year. Lizzie has it. Can you tell everybody what she has and how you figured out like how she could have that job in the 1800s? Um, well, part of the appeal of writing about the second part of the 19th century is that, of course, it was the great age of industrialization. And that meant for the first time, people had a choice. They didn't have to live with their families. They could go to the city and they could earn money, not very much money, but they could have a kind of autonomy that was not possible previously. And Lizzie is one of those people. Um, she gets a job as a locomotive tracer. And everything I know about locomotive tracing comes from the girl's own magazine, which ran yearly competitions in which girls described their jobs. And the young woman, Giselle, Giselle? No, Idleweiss, I think is her pseudonym, who wrote um, about locomotive tracing won the prize one year and I read her fabulous essay about how to do this and it's a little hard to describe but if you want to come up to me privately I can describe uh, stretching the canvas and <laughs> the kinds of crayons and pens you use and she's literally tracing out locomotives for engineers so yes. that they it was like early CAD drawings yes. um, but she's doing with the tracing and I there's a lovely detail at some point she was the first go and then someone would come in later to do the color like bird sienna for the wooden parts or yeah. something like that yeah it's just extraordinary yeah. and, and now getting back to the to the 19th century setting were there challenges to the story, like there's a telegram that comes at one point, there's some letters that are involved, uh, there's a lot of anonymity that comes in the city and intimacy that comes in the village. Were there certain things from the 21st century that you found kind of leaking into the past or vice versa? Or was or were you challenged writing in the past like, oh, if they're not going to know because they don't have Find My Friends where Lizzie is right now? Well, happily standing over me or standing beside me, I had my dear friend, Andrea Barrett, who 
writes wonderful stories and novels, nearly all set in the late 19th, early 20th century. So she was very firm about my commitment to um, fidelity, fidelity of fact. And, and also she is the person to whom you should be so grateful that there aren't 200 more pages of gathering the eggs and milking the cows because I was very keen really on that. Good. I wanted you all to know how to milk a cow by the time you finish the road from Belhaven. Um, it worried me that I skimped a little bit on the detail. Um, so, um, it, of course, there are there are frustrations about about that, and sometimes, you know, little things would slip by me, like in the passage I just read. Originally, I had Lizzie making tea for her dolls, plural, and then I thought, no, no, she would have had one doll. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't have dolls, plural, uh, for instance. So I was constantly looking for little things like that. And then, of course, there were surprises, like trains were more efficient than they are nowadays. Uh, the postal service was excellent. Um, <laughs> Uh, unlike today, I would say. Yeah. So, um, you know, quite a lot of aspects of our modern life were more successful in the 1880s and 1890s. And I was also interested in writing sort of against the Victorian novel. I mean, the Victorian novel is a thing of great beauty and my great love affair is with the Victorian novel, but it isn't an accurate presentation of manners and morals in the 19th century. I mean, much is invented. Uh, for instance, in the 1850s and 1860s, I think something like one in five houses in London was a brothel. So imagine that in Milwaukee. Imagine that as you walk home. We don't have to. Oh, oh OK, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, oh, this is being taped. Yeah, I won't. Give, I won't tell you Liam's address. Um, 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 you know. So this is this kind of the novel both opens a door into the nineteenth century, but it is also a kind of scrim, and I wanted to get behind that scrim in a number of ways. Can I ask one more? And this is my last question, and then I'm going to throw it out to the audience for your much wiser questions. Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, along those lines, it's a very powerful look into the role of women at this time what and what roles women could have. And it's a central challenge for Lizzie as she moves through the book. There's certain things that this industrialization is allowing her to do, and there's certain things that this society is very much not allowing her to do. And I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about how you navigated that on the page. I think I navigated it with, it's a, with great difficulty, actually, trying to, I mean, I didn't want Lizzie to be a, a proto-feminist or to have correct political views or to enunciate things in the way that we enunciate them. But I, I think I'm extremely interested in writing about sex, which my students would all argue is ridiculous because I you know, I'm always critiquing their sex scenes and myself, um, I'm writing scenes in which people hold hands on a sofa and then there's a space break. Um, but, but what I'm interested in is that way in which as a child, you're so passionate and you're so intelligent and you think you understand everything that's going on. And then you suddenly discover this thing called sexual attraction or passion or whatever you want to call it, romance. And you realize all the adults around you that, that you thought were facing true north are being are actually like weathercocks. They're following around magnetic north. And I just think that's such an interesting moment when someone crosses that line. And in the 19th century, we don't see that line cross very often, except in the Brontes, except in Emily Bronte, perhaps. So, and I was just, I'll, I was just going to add that one of the powerful things for me were the friendships that women had and the rivalries in your book. I thought that was really interesting. No one had a very simple story to tell, yeah. uh, especially back there in the city, yeah. um, where they all have kind of colluding things, and sometimes they're at each other's throats, and sometimes they're allies. It's always shifting. It's it's really it's really really fascinating, mm -hmm. um, but even more fascinating are the questions that are lurking out there in the crowd. So I'd love to hear if you have a couple. That would be wonderful. You're brave, not. 
I will say while you all gather your thoughts that one of the things I have over my desk is something that the mother of an old friend said to me, I, and I cannot remember the context. She said, everyone has a secret sorrow. And I find that so helpful, both for thinking about my characters, but also when I meet someone with whom I do not feel immediate rapport, I try to hold on to that idea. So, but I try to make it that everyone in the road from Belhaven has a secret sorrow. They absolutely do. Yeah. And, and some of them are blessed with a secret joy yeah, as well. A secret joy, yes. yes. Questions? Yes. Oh, that's why you look familiar. How lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. And hasn't that stood you in good stead? <laughs> I'm looking. Isn't he brilliant? <laughs> yes. No, that's a, it's a wonderful question. Well, I'm very, as a writer, I'm very committed to plot. I mean, I, I love plot as a reader. I love that feeling of wanting to know what will happen and being engulfed in a book. So I was really trying to in in my own uh, you know way to recreate some of the feeling i had in my childhood teenage reading of those books that i just immersed myself in and that felt more alive to me than my own life um and i did really struggle with the plot of the road from belhaven um there were quite a number of places when i thought i am in the slough of despond yes. And this is really, really tedious, and something has to happen. And the novel is a Bildungsroman, and it is a journey, and both those things helped me. So I think when in doubt, I put my character in motion. I sent her to the village, I sent her to the town, I sent her to the city, I got her on a train. Um, I was always trying to keep her in, in motion, um, trying to get her to the next place. Is that kind of an answer? Yeah. 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 I thought Margo and I were talking about this at dinner, and I can't say where it is in the book because it'll spoil things, but I was really fascinated by your ability, the book's ability to kind of put itself, walk the reader into box canyons. And there were many times I thought, there's no getting out of this. This is this is trouble. And I was getting panicky as a read. I was like, where's this gonna go? And then Oh, it's just it's it's a book of gasps. Like there's uh, the more in this book than I've read in a long any book for a long. It's like oh, oh, it's kind of startling. My wife can attest that I was a noisy reader. <laughs> <laughs> are there other questions? <laughs> Things you'd like to know? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> of course, this is a hard question for me. Um, and I'm going to give a confusing answer because I have this family who all died but I resourcefully adopted a family. So I have an adopted family who I'm happy to say are doing very well. And my adopted father, along with my beloved dead mother had second sight. And I asked him one day if he thought I had inherited my mother's gifts. And he said, I think you have, but your life is too busy and too urban for you to experience them. So I'm still waiting for that moment when I step out of my urban busyness and I'm suddenly awash in visions. Well, 
are the Packers going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> yes. That's a Wisconsin that you had to know that would come up from Wisconsin. No, well, thank you for remembering criminals. And I think I'm just really interested in what the uncanny can do for fiction, how it can enlarge the territory of fiction, um, how it can italicize certain things, open certain portals. And I don't exactly think of myself as writing speculative fiction, which might be the term nowadays, but I have now written three novels in which there are experiences of something like the supernatural. And in The Boy in the Field, there's a dog who almost talks. <laughs> So it's it's clearly something I'm interested in. Um, but yeah. <laughs> thank you. Did you think about setting this book in the present day? I, you know, I I didn't. I was um I was writing another novel in March 2020. And suddenly I woke up to the fact that I was not going to be able to go back to Scotland anytime soon. That everyone else, like everyone else, I was a prisoner of COVID. And I was so appalled by that that I thought I must write something that allows me to go to Scotland every day in its, in its purest form, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so the road from Belhaven was my magic carpet that mm. allowed me to go there every day. And somehow setting it in the past made it more like that. I mean, it, I was setting it in my in a Victorianized version of my childhood. And that was deeply satisfying. Thank you. I, I was just wording that and I was like, I've got a question. <laughs> uh, maybe one or two more. <laughs> Well, the wonderful thing about a bookstore reading is that not only can you continue the conversation after the microphones are put away, but you can also buy the book. It's amazing. It's a whole store full of these things. So I think um, if we could thank Margot for her visit with us today with a round of applause. And I know she'll be happy to continue answering questions in the front of the store, but thank you so much for coming to Milwaukee. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Liam, for your beautiful books and for this eloquent conversation. Thank you. Run I'm going to follow Margaret wherever she can. Run to buy the paperback of When in Rome. You only have a couple of weeks to wait. Yes. Excellent. <laughs>